Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone? Um, we can all come, come in. Um, I actually wanted to start this morning just sharing like a short testimony because I love testimonies. Anybody else? Do you love testimonies? <laughs> I love testimonies because they remind me how much I love Jesus. <laughs> um, so this past week, I went to Rockville because I'm getting ready to have LASIK surgery done. Like, I'm so excited about this. For my eyes, I'm going to be able to see without these. So I'm, like, really excited about this. And I go for, like, my initial uh, consultation. And I'm sitting there talking to this doctor. And I've already been there for two hours. <laughs> you know how, doc you know how it is. <laughs> you go and it's, it takes a while. And then, um, I, like I said, I've already been there for two hours. I've already gone through what should be everything that needs to go through, you know, for my initial consult. And the doctor says, he says to me, he says, well, what do you do? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm a kid's pastor. I love kids. And I don't know, like, <laughs> it was such a simple statement. But for the next hour, I sat in this doctor's office while he poured his heart out about his kids. Like he just opened up, he has concerns, he has things he's working through, and, and like just that, just that one thing of just being open, he just opened up. <laughs> and literally for another hour, I sat there and just listened. And then I got to tell him, like, I got to tell him, you're a good dad, you know? Like, I got to just encourage him and love him a little bit. And I just think, there's a couple things I think. One, I'm just so reminded at how much I love Jesus and that we get to participate in his love that way. Like, like, I get to be the one that sits there and listen to this person's heart and value it. Like, and I don't know, I just feel so honored. We get to partake, not just for ourselves, but like engaging and partaking of his heart for the person in front of us, right? And I, I just feel so honored to be able to partake in his heart that way. And to know that that's how he loves us. And I, I thought of this scripture in Zechariah. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I have several favorites. But um, in Zechariah 8, it starts talking about the city of God. And it's one of my favorites because it talks about kids dancing in the streets of the city of God. So it's like always one of my go-tos. But I was drawn to this. It's um, Zechariah 8, 12, and it says, For there will be peace for the seed. The vine will yield its fruit. Everyone say, the vine. Stand up. <laughs> the vine will yield. This is a promise. This is not, man, I hope the fruit of Jesus in the earth and the fruit of Jesus in me, and I hope some of it comes up. No, it will, right? The vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce. And the heavens will give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all things. I, say, I will 
we will inherit all things, every single heart. Isn't that amazing? And this is something we get to yield, to partake in every single day with each other and with people we've never met before, just by the posture of our hearts being open. I'm just so thankful. Jesus, we are so thankful for your heart. We are thankful that we get to participate with your heart. You are so good. You're so faithful. You're so present. We love you. We have a thousand reasons to say we love Jesus, right? We just love you. We honor you. And we look to engage with this beautiful, glorious, holy heart of heaven that is among us everywhere we are. Because you are here. You never leave. You're so good. How's everybody doing today? Me too. Me too. Let's worship the Lord together. Sign that you are with me, a fire by night. 
So I'm going to be really, uh, really transparent this morning. Um, I had kind of a crappy week this past week, and I, I, can't, I can't go into detail, um, but I, I, was, I was hurt in a way that I don't think I've ever been hurt in my entire life, and I'm standing up here, and I'm, I'm having a really hard time singing that right now, but I'm going to sing it anyway, and I'm going to ask you guys if you would press in with me because I do feel like I'm in Egypt a little bit right now. So if you guys are willing to do that, can we do that bridge one more time together? Let's get some joy in the house first though.
things that build faith when we're standing in our Egypt.
I'm finding myself in a new place Where things that don't matter fade away And I'm standing in a new place Where I have been restored And now your love is taking over The same love that rescued me And now I'm laying down my crowns At the feet of the one who is Worthy of it all sing this together one more time. I'm finding myself in a new place Where things that don't matter fade away And we're standing in a new place 
where we have been restored. And your love is taking over. The same love that rescued me. And now I'm laying down my crown at the feet of the one who is worthy of it all. And we're singing, holy, oh God, you're worthy to receive all praise, to receive all praise. Holy, oh God, you're worthy to receive all praise. To receive One more time. Praise. We're singing, holy. receive all praise, to receive all praise, and holy, oh God, you're worthy, to receive all praise, to receive all jump right into this today. If you brought Bibles today, you turn to Matthew chapter 11. Starting in verse 25. For lack of a better term, until I think of something better, today's just going to be called come and go. Hopefully you'll understand what that means after I read these couple scriptures. I'll be in Matthew 11, 25 to 30, and then I'll be in Mark 16, 14 through 18. And if I have time, I'll get to the book of Ephesians, but knowing me, I'll never get there. <laughs> Matthew 11, 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble of heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, I want to do a little exegesis here, which means I want to just kind of go line by line really quick through here and kind of give you a little bit of the both original language context type explanation of what Jesus is saying here. So he starts out in verse 25 by praising the Lord as a human. He's praising the Lord of heaven and earth because he has hidden all of these parables, all of these uh, secrets of the kingdom. It says that he's praising the Lord because he's hidden them from those who would consider themselves wise and intelligent. It's the wisdom of God to hide things from people who already think they're smart without the Lord. Okay? So if there's ever been hope for any of you dumb people, 
in front of you unwise people, it's the fact that the Lord wants you to know things that smart, intelligent people don't know. Someone say amen. 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 Here we go. Two dumb people. Great. No, we're all there. We're all there. But like he doesn't actually call us dumb. Thank goodness he's not like me. He says, he says, infants. He calls us infants. Which means that we're not dumb. It just means that we're willing to literally humble ourselves to the point where we're willing to learn all over again. Those are the ones who the Lord is teaching. Those are the ones whose hearts and ears are open. And I'm wondering how many that describes in 2021. I feel like there are so many people out there who are trying to tell us everything we need to know. I know I got plenty of people telling me what they think is right and how they think I'm wrong. You probably do too. And at the end of the day, those who really hear the Lord are those who are really open to learn. Because this is what he says. He says, you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, and you have revealed them to infants. It reminds me of the scripture that when he brings the children and the, the disciples are saying, hey, stay away from Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, come. I put them here. I want them on my lap. Because the kingdom belongs to such as these. The kingdom, which is the realm in which Jesus is centered and fully worshipped belongs to those who consider themselves open to wonder, open to learn. Don't think they have it all figured out yet. So if that describes you, the kingdom belongs to you. And the Lord is revealing his heart to you. So if you're open, if, you don't, if you're not hard cement, if you're wet cement, willing to be shaped, willing to be taught, the kingdom belongs to you. And I believe this is church. Church is a place that infants come to remember who they really are. I think that's why we've come. If you come consistently to church, I'm hoping, and I believe it is, because you have much to learn. You're willing and open. Verse 26, yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. So revealing things to infants and hiding things from those who already have it all figured out is well-pleasing in the sight of God. Then he talks about himself. He says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Verse 27, and is a mystery of the Trinity. If you guys remember at the end of last year, I talked about the Trinity and how the Lord has shown me how Father, Son, and Spirit are actually all one. They're all the same person. They're not separate beings inside of this meeting room in heaven. They're all different representations or hearts of who God is. God, the Father, is the very heart and nature, the invisible part of God. Jesus said in John 1, or John says in John 1 about Jesus, that Jesus is the revealed manifestation of the invisible God. So Jesus, then, is the revealed part of God that has always been invisible prior to Jesus. And so verse 27 is that mystery being revealed. Not necessarily two separate people or two separate beings, the original language is actually much more blended. It's much more a revelation of the invisible now being made visible. And then he speaks about God willingly revealing himself at the end of 27. And then come to me, verse 28. Here's the come part of come and go. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. That phrase doesn't just mean those who are tired, those who have worked really hard, and now we just kind of fall at the feet of Jesus, worn out and fatigued. Really what that scripture in the original language and the context means is those who are tired of living their own way. Those who have become broken and worn out by living outside of relationship with the one who created them. He says, hey, those of you who are tired of a way of life not sourced in the spirit of the one who authored you, those who have been trying it your own way, those who have been making up their own rules and trying to live by them, hey, come on over here. Because over here is where you originally came from. And if you come here, 
and start again like an infant. You will begin to learn a new way of life that is radically different than what this world has taught you, what your experiences have taught you, and I will show you how to truly live from a place called rest. Rest is the place in God where things have much less resistance. The reason why we're heavy laden, the reason why we're weary, is we're constantly running up against resistance, friction, those things that are against us. But when we come to Jesus, everything in the Lord is for us. Everything is for us in the presence of God. Everything is about us and about how we were originally created to be. So when we come to Jesus, we find rest there because that which is for us is the only thing that exists. If you remember, the heavenly dimension or the heavenly realm is the place where God has no rival. If you want to talk about the heavens, it's not just up and above the natural realm. The heavenly realm can be right here. I desire to build a church with Jesus where the context of that culture, nothing rivals the Lord. Nothing opposes his thoughts, his ways, his intentions. I'm praying that my household, the Derniak household, increasingly becomes a place where God is not opposed, where there's constant flow with Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the heavenly dimension. And that's where he says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let everything that's in heaven, where nothing resists the Lord, nothing resists the ways, the heart of God is revealed here on earth. That's the goal Jesus has. Come to me, all you who have been fighting against the flow, who have been swimming against the rip currents, come to the place where everything is flow with you. And I'll give you rest. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There's a whole new way of life in Jesus that's meant to be learned. Because I'm gentle and humble of heart. He is uh, juxtaposing humble of heart and gentle with what lifestyle we were living prior to that. Look, whether we like it or not, in the world there is this system that is the opposite of gentle and humble of heart. Jesus is juxtaposing his ways versus the ways that currently exist, exist on the planet, ways that were not authored in him. So he's juxtaposing gentle and humble of heart with the spirit that's in the world. So the opposite of gentle is, say some words. Harsh. Aggressive. Harsh. harsh. Aggressive, harsh. Anything else? Blaming. <coughs> Those are the op stern, stern, self-serving. That's the opposite of gentle. Wow, that was way better than I could have been. Jesus says those things are what's happening in the world. That's what your spirit encounters as you go to work, as you walk about your day. The spirit of this world is against that which is gentle. You guys with me? He says, come over here and learn of me because that way is not my way. Infants enjoy places that are gentle, that are protective, that are assuring, that are nurturing, that give safe, good places to grow and to learn. Someone say amen to that. Doesn't that feel good? And then we're supposed to expand that culture from the presence of God. And then humble of heart. What's the opposite of humble? Come on. Proud. Proud, arrogant. What? Boastful. I mean, that's out there. I mean, if you want to get your word out, if you want to get your opinion out there, you've got to be raw. And Jesus is just like, come if you want to hear. Come if you want to experience. So his way of getting the word out is not proud, is not arrogant, is not boastful, is not aggressive. Come, learn of me. It's almost like the float down the jig. There's going to be some that have to paddle have to get in the kayaks, and then there's the rest of us who are just like, can we just lay back and just let this thing take us where we need to go? And Jesus is saying, hey, those of you who have been fighting against the current of this world, trying to figure out who you really are, could you just come and you, can you just rest for a little while? 
Just come over here. You don't have to fight to be who you are. You don't have to be aggressively to get your point across and to establish the kingdom of God. In fact, he juxtaposes some more in another place where he says, the violent lay hold of the kingdom. You guys know that, right? He says, up until the time of Jesus, he says the kingdom was forcefully advancing and forceful men were laying hold of it. Many people have preached that scripture, in my opinion, in a different way than Jesus was intending it. He was trying to juxtapose his way of advancing the kingdom versus those who were aggressively trying to get their opinions and points across. That is not the way of the kingdom, according to Jesus. The way of the kingdom is come. The way of the kingdom is invitation. The way of the kingdom is let light shine like a beacon on the stormy shores and let ships find safe harbor here. That's the kingdom. In the midst of this storm called the culture of this world is a safe harbor called the kingdom. By the way, last week, uh, Jocelyn was talking about opportunity and I wanted to kind of do a Chris Wong and raise my hand and tell you exactly what I was thinking when she said opportunity, but I didn't. So I'll tell you now, my mom called me last week, which by the way, anytime your mom calls, answer the dang phone. I'm telling you because mom's got something for you. Even if she's nagging on you, look inside. There's something good for you in there. So mom called me up to tell me what she had heard from another preacher about what the definition of opportunity was. And she said it's actually a Latin word. And this is it. I love this definition of opportunity. It changes my perspective about it. It is uh, either warm, safe winds, winds, like winds, or warm, safe currents that take you to safe harbor. That's what the word actually means originally when it came out of the Latin. It means when you get into a current or you get into a flow or you get into a wind pattern that gets you to a place that's good and safe for you. How many people want to take an opportunity? I I can tell you most of the time when someone says, do you want an opportunity, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little scared because usually opportunity means work, it means risk, it means faith, it means... uh, But the word opportunity actually means if you jump in, yes, it's different than your current reality, but it's going to take you someplace good. Oh, I love that. I thank my mom for that. And I said, Mom, I'm preaching that. I'll even give you credit. But that is so beautiful. So every one of you in this room, the next time you see an opportunity arise, take it because it's taking you someplace good. It's a warm current or a warm wind that will take Anyway, okay, I've said that seven times. Okay, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is not only Jesus, but hopefully this is the context of church. Take my yoke. My, uh, he wants to partner with us. He doesn't want us to carry the load alone, nor does he want to carry the load alone. He wants to do this work with us and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble of heart. You will find rest for your souls. This last verse, verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that, but it does not mean the work is easy. It does not mean that what he gives us to do is just going to be a cakewalk and it is just a float down the jig. Actually, no. The float down the jig is how it starts. But eventually someone has to organize it. Eventually someone has to blow up all of the... uh, inner tubes and all that stuff. There's work involved to create the float. Come on. There's work involved to create the environment where infants can come and rest and learn of me. So this is what that verse means when it says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It doesn't mean, hey, it's all a cakewalk from here. Has anybody else experienced a Christian walk is not a cakewalk? Right, it's not. But this is what he says. He says, my yoke is good and my burden is fits you. That's what it means. It doesn't mean it's all going to be easy. It means it fits you. It means it works. It's like Saul's armor didn't work for David. David had to take it off and he had to take his sling and go five, five stones. That is what fit David. That's how the Lord trained up David. And for every one of us, it's not that from here on out everything's going to be easy, and if it's hard, then God's not in it. Actually, no. It means that what the Lord has for us, what he's created us for, is for us. That's why comparison and doing what other people do 
will be like what the world system was trying to do. You're going to have to be aggressive and you're going to have to force yourself and you're going to have to be loud and boisterous and obnoxious in order to get the work of God done. But if you realize that the yoke is good and it fits you, then you can be humble and gentle of heart and advance the kingdom. How are we doing? That's how the church was meant to operate both inwardly and then outwardly into the earth. So the more forceful the church has to be, I just want to tell you, the less the Spirit of the Lord is involved. I'm going to say that again. The more forceful we feel as the church that we have to be, the less the Spirit of God is involved. Yeah. People will feel pushed away because it's not a, it's a very similar spirit to what they're already experiencing in the world. The problem I have seen too much is the church tries to mimic what's happening in the world in order to get the same, almost like a competition. Like, they're being like this, so we have to be like this. And the Lord says, come here. Come over here. I want you to learn of me. There's a way. There is a, a flow. There is a a power and a reality that supersedes and comes under that which is at work in the world and literally swallows it up inside. How are we doing? So there's, there's the come part. Okay, here's the go. Go to Mark 16. This is after he resurrects. Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table. You got to love Jesus. I mean, he is always on point. He he resurrects. The guys are all like, what the heck's going on? And the very first thing he does is what? What what does it mean when someone reproaches you? Is it, hey, man, great job. No. No. The very first thing he does is reproach them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. Bottom line, you didn't listen to the ladies. Because remember, it was the ladies who first saw him, right? Guys, you need to humble yourselves and be gentle of heart and realize that the ladies have some things to say. And you should listen to... Well, finally, Orpa, amen. That's the first... (laughs) <laughs> no, just kidding. But that's, it's true. That's why he reproached them, because the ladies had some really important things to say, and the guys were like, whatever. But they were so, if you guys remember the story, they, she actually ran to the tomb to go find out what was going on. She was there waiting. She was there to see. And then when she came back and reported, they, were, they didn't believe. And he reproached them. Jesus corrected them because they didn't remember what he had taught them. Listen to this. Jesus corrected them because they didn't remember what he had taught them when the world had its way with him and them. If you think about it, that whole process between getting arrested, being taken before the Jewish leaders, and then being taken before Pilate, and then being crucified, the world had its way with Jesus. And then during that same time, the world had its way with the disciples. And in that time was a time of testing for the disciples. Jesus had just spent three years intensely teaching, intensely showing them the way of the kingdom, the way of the Father, the way of the heavenly in the midst of the world. It's almost like he brought them inside of a cocoon for three years. And then at the end of those three years, the cocoon was ripped open violently. Jesus was crucified. And the guys went through this really, like, what in the world is going on? But the problem is, Jesus had prepared them the whole time. He had been teaching them. He had been saying to them, hey, I want you to know that in three days, this body will be, in three days, the whole thing about being crucified, I'll be torn down, and in three days, I'll bring this temple back up. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. He warned them. And the whole time, they're saying, no, it'll never happen. Remember that? The responses of the disciples, no way will that ever happen. And he's like, I'm trying to prepare you, but something good's really coming afterwards. I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you as orphans. He was preparing them. And it says they had forgotten. And I think we have a tendency, even today, that when the world gets a hold of us and things don't go the way we had hoped it would go, that we forget I loved how Jen was singing, let us not forget what Jesus had said and what Jesus had done because there will be things that go wrong. 
like universally wrong, nationally wrong, politically wrong. And we have to remember the goodness of God. We have to remember what he had done in our lives. So yeah, he'll reproach you. The 15. And then he said to them, I love this, right after being reproached, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Like, I'm going to tell you, that is a leader. That is a leader that has so much faith and trust because he just rebuked them from un- for unbelief. It's almost like, like if Jesus were a little more human like you and me, we would probably say, okay, we need to start all over again. Because you guys obviously didn't get it the first time, so we're going to start this process all over again. And instead of that, he just rebukes them, and he says, okay, now go. I love that. There is so much trust. You know, and for some of us in this, you know, like if, if in a worldly thought process, in a system of this world way of thinking, we would say to ourselves, oh boy, okay, we need to repeat third grade here. No, but Jesus, like, he says, no, that seed is in them. It's there. Yes, they went through a hard time, but that hard time and my reproach of them is enough for them now to go back out and go do what they were created to do. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 16. He who has believed, has been baptized, shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. I want to read that verse again. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. That word saved means delivered, healed, restored, made whole. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. This really doesn't have anything to do with the message, but I feel like it's an important little commercial break in the midst of it. The word condemned does not mean go to hell. For the longest time the church has preached that that word means if you don't believe, you go to hell. I'm not saying there isn't a hell. I'm not saying there isn't some kind of afterlife for those that don't believe. What I'm saying here is that verse is not talking about going to hell. I'm going to tell you what this verse means. He who has believed shall be healed, restored, delivered, and made whole. He who has not believed shall be, and it's a really long Greek word, and I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to tell you what the Greek word means. It means brought low. Now, when people, I think when uh, English guys began to translate that word, they thought the low meant send them to hell. Low, hell, close enough, that's what we're going to call it. But the reality is it means like to humble them. It's tied into the verse that says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, lest you be, okay? What Jesus is saying is, look, you got a chance. Humble yourself. Make the decision to lower yourself to be gentle and humble of heart. Hello? Learn this of me. Because if you don't learn it of me, then it's going to have to happen to you. And trust me, you would rather have the choice of humbling yourself versus having been humbled. I've experienced both. I really enjoy humbling myself now. Because being humbled is painful. Being humbled is hard. Being humbled is humiliating. Hello? The same word. Jesus is not saying, I will send you to hell. He says, I will bring you low so that you can experience being healed, delivered, saved, all of that. You guys with me so far? All right, commercial over. Continue. 17. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We need to start preaching those two verses again in the church. I want to say them again. These signs... These things will happen as a result of belief. He's bringing it back up to the fact that they did not believe. Remember this. This is all in context. The reason why he's encouraged, he's reproaching them because they're unbelief, because he wants these signs to accompany them. He wants to cast out demons. Don't think of dark little ugly imps walking around hanging on people. Don't think of it that way. If you go look up that original Greek word, it has more to do with thought processes and ways of life people have made their own that are not associated with the kingdom of Matthew chapter 11. You guys with me so far? 
Don't think of demons as these ugly little creatures crawling around trying to tempt you. They're more along the lines of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that we have to fight against strongholds that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. That's what Jesus is talking about. No one does a better job of casting out demons in the body of Christ than teachers. I'm going to say it again. No one does a better job of casting out demons than teachers because teachers reveal the thought process of God that's accurate. And if received, the teaching overwhelms and undermines lies and thought processes that establish dark beliefs. You guys okay? This is really important. Don't forsake listening and receiving teaching in the body of Christ because teaching replaces false beliefs that hinder your ability to walk free. You guys okay? Yeah. Not only will you cast out demons, you will speak with new tongues. Don't just think of Shadabah Hadabah so no one can understand you kind of tongues. He's actually talking about you don't need to go to language school to go preach the gospel in a nation you've never been to. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you guys and you're going to be able to speak languages that when you go, you can talk about me without having Duolingo. Which, by the way, is about to be a brand new stock on the stock exchange. So get in while it's low. There's your stock tip for the day. Just getting them all in. Please, I feel like tongues has been way, I mean, I've talked about this before, but it has been just weirded out in the church. And most people just completely ignore the idea of tongues because of what it has been made into when the goal of tongues was that every tribe, nation, and tongue would hear the gospel, would hear the good news, would be able to hear the shout, come! If there's one word every one of us should learn every language is that word. And pretty much every language says Hezu or pretty much, seriously, Hezu, hallelujah. Same in almost every language. You got that. Learn the word come. Already know Jesus, already know hallelujah, and the Lord will start to work. You okay? They will pick up serpents. That simply means no, no evil plan, no deception can stop you. Don't think of it as just slithery snakes crawling around. Guys, seriously, don't forget the serpent represents deception. Re serpent represents lies and false assumptions about God. Did God really say? You guys remember that? It's the first thing a serpent said in the scriptures. And he wished he never said it. You will be able to pick up serpents. You'll be able to hold things of doubt about God and be able to say, no, this is what's true. Amen? Then the next thing is, you will be able to drink any deadly poison. That does not mean you go around drinking hydrochloric acid. That, but it may be Dr. Pepper. Because that's deadly poison. Sorry. Sorry. It will not hurt you. Okay? Again, I, I really feel like this is much more symbology than it is walk around drinking deadly poison. I think what God is really talking about here is both symbolic, like, look, you're going to take some things in, but if you hold fast to me, it won't hurt you. You guys with me? There's going to be times where you drink of the social media fountain and you're going to kind of get into that mix a little bit, but then you're going to remember me and you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's right, wrong spigot, turn. And it will not hurt them. And then they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. I don't think it's just physical sick, even though I think it is and I want to see it happen more and more, but I think it's sick in general. Because if you think about the word save, it actually means to be healed, delivered, and made whole. There are sick people in their minds, sick people in their emotional state, sick souls, sick understanding of who people are. And when we lay our hands upon them, when we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, healing begins to take place, body, soul, and spirit. All right, let me show you some things that I got out of these scriptures. We come to Jesus and church, I believe this context is to learn and practice what it is to be sons and daughters of the Father. We come to Jesus 
Because number one, he is the Father. Back to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the very heart and nature of who God is. He is the source of life. We come to Jesus because he's where we came from in the first place. When, John tells, when Jesus tells Nicodemus in the book of John, you must be born again, that's what he's saying. He says, stop living sourced in ESPN and Netflix and all this other stuff. Stop living sourced there and turn and live sourced in the spirit from which you were born. And I promise you, you will have fulfillment multiplied abundantly more than what you have been drinking from before. That's what he's saying here. That's why we come to Jesus. Also, because Jesus is the highest form of what it means to be human. That's why we come to Jesus. Jesus, whether we like it or not, whether we want to say it or not, was both fully God and fully human. So when we come to Jesus, we come because we get to learn what it's like to be real human beings. Jesus is the ultimate example of both who God is and what it means to be human. He is the pattern son, I like to call it. Bill Britton called it that, and I think that's a wonderful term for Jesus. Our eternal example of what a child of God is. So when, when Jesus is the center, when Jesus is the hub of this wheel, and he sources the church, everything about what we are and who we are comes from the abundant life Jesus came to give. And here's why we come to church, the come part. We come to church because Jesus is center in the church. I know this might sound a little overly simplistic to you. There is nowhere else on planet Earth where there is more intentionality, regardless of its flaws, regardless of how it's doing, there is no more intentional place on planet Earth where Jesus is center than in the church. Think about it. We go into the world and we build business. We have government. We uh, build family and all those kinds of things. There is nowhere where this room right now, where the intention, right or wrong how it's done, the intention is Jesus is worshipped. Where God and Holy Spirit have the most opportunity at freedom and at people's lives. This is why we come to church. Because here is where we intentionally practice what it means to be truly human beings, truly children of God. Look, you leave here today, and there is nowhere you're going to go. Maybe your home. And I'm going to say in most cases that's probably not the case. No offense. There's no better context, no healthier context than the church. I'm going to say it again. There is no healthier context than the church. Yes, it's broken. Yes, it's hurting. Yes, we don't know what we're doing half the time. I'll be the first to admit it. As a leader in the church, I'm not always sure what I'm doing, but I can tell you this, the goal is Jesus. And if the goal is Jesus, you can trust who he is. Hello? This is really important because when you leave here, you're not going to go to Giant and the goal is not Jesus. The goal is to make money. The goal is to get you to buy stuff. Pretty much when you walk out of here, that's the main feeling and spirit you will get to try to get something from you. Where in the church is the place where you're actually supposed to get from the Lord. Where we receive from and honor. As we honor the Lord, we receive of Him. We open ourselves up and we receive from Him. What an incredible opportunity church is. It's when we make it something else that I think it begins to hurt us. If you, and I, I've seen many churches do this, that's why I don't talk about offerings and giving a whole lot because I think the church for too long has totally abused offerings, givings, and finances. I'm going to talk about giving and finances this year. I mean, I've, I've been in Africa where they took seven offerings in one church service. Seven. One church service. It wasn't even like, hey, throughout the day. One church service, different offerings. Man, and this is the funniest thing. People came up seven times. So I don't know if they just split their offering up and did it seven ways, but this is one of the things they did. Did you ever see these kind of offerings? And then it goes inside the... 
and they pull their hand back out. I'm like, Lord, give me eyes to see if there's anything even in those hands. Like, I think sometimes people are just doing it so it looks like they're giving. We've come to the place at the church where we just try to get things from people. Don't forget, Jesus says, come unto me for I am gentle and humble of heart. I am juxtaposed to the spirit of this world. In this context, in the context of sons and daughters who are learning of the Father and who Jesus is, this is the one context where we're not supposed to try to get things from you. Not try to take advantage of you. Not try to get you to do something. This is the place where you can safely and wonderfully encounter the one who says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Amen? That's what this context is. That's why it's healthy. That's why we should be encouraging people, get to the context called church. It's a called out group of people who are practicing a new way of life. Come and practice it with us. Otherwise, you're constantly belaboring. You'll constantly be trying to figure it out where the answer is here and his name is Jesus and he's intentionally worshipped. One of the greatest things I think about church is that in this church context, there are moms and dads, big brothers and big sisters who have been practicing this longer than us. There are people in this context we can learn from that we can kind of model our lives after. We can kind of watch them as they, and we can build relationship with them. And even then as we leave the four walls of a church meeting, we can remember what we heard or what we experienced of those who are more mature than us and we can begin to walk that out out there. I think church is so vitally important. And then the go, I love the go. Here, by the way, I did a quick word search in the NAS, which is the New American Standard. I did a quick word search of the word go in the New Testament and the word come in the New Testament. Which word do you think was more, come or go? I mean, just raise your hand if it's go. Throw it up there. Anybody come, more comes. Double the amount of comes is go. Wow. Serious. I was totally shocked. I, I expected go, you know? Because all the church, you know, it's all like, come on, get out there. Go, 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 go. And I realized, and not all of the comes have to do with like, come unto me and all this stuff. I mean, sometimes, but not many. But a lot of times, the word come is like, hey, you need to come over here and learn. You need to get out of that context and come over to me. You need to get out of that way of life and come over into my way of life. Your heart needs healed. Your mind needs transformed. Come over here. 450 comes. 250 go in the New Testament. So there's something powerful about that. And I think we've emphasized go a whole lot, but there may be a whole lot of going that's not empowered by enough coming. Just put it out there for you. But going is good. Going is important. If you ask me, going is the point of the coming. Okay? So come, we don't just gather to gather. We don't just come to Jesus. So we can say, oh, this is so great. That's wonderful. No. There are people that need to experience him. And they will never come until we go. So we go into all the world. That's what Mark encourages us. Not me, Mark, but Mark the Bible verse, uh, book. We go into the world to be light. Yes. And we shout. We declare the goodness of God with our lives. This is so important. Be light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then right after he says, you're the light of the world. And no light is ever hidden under a bushel basket. We put it up on a hill so that everyone can see it. And so they know where safe harbor is. They know where the opportunity is. And they jump into the flow. And then they go toward the light. Follow the moth. Follow the bugs. They know. As soon as you turn on your outside light in the summertime, what happens? All kinds of bugs. They're flocking. Guys, they're created by the same God. When you shine, the bugs will come. That was a really terrible analogy, but I think you get the point. When you shine, they'll come. Like, look, if you build it, yeah, they're going to play a baseball game this year out there. out there in Iowa. That's so cool. On the field of dreams, they're going to actually play a major league baseball game. Very cool. 
Commercial break number three. You're welcome. Okay, so going is all about being light outside of here. Look, this is not the place where you're light. Church is not the place where you're light. This is the place where your light gets turned on. Your light gets more energy. It, it's taught how to burn more efficiently, more brightly, whatever all the... How long can I go with that analogy before it's not good anymore? But I think you get it. But then the light actually works out there. It needs to leave Lowe's and get plugged in. All right, done. That's enough. So we go into all the world to be light, to draw the rest of God's family. So important. The rest of God's family needs light to get home. I want to say it again because I think it's really important. The rest of God's family is walking in darkness and it needs light to get home. And the darkness is not, like, don't think of it as their dumb stupid. No, they just, they only know the way of life the world has taught them. And they're waiting for someone's light to shout and beckon from their life, come. Another reason why we go into all the world is that we expand the boundaries of the kingdom of God. Okay? I don't think we talk enough about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the realm of God, literally the very person of God, and the, uh, the sphere and the aura, uh, there's better words than that. Let me put it this way. When Dawn walks in the room, before she ever gets near me, I know how she's feeling. Anybody else have someone like that in your life? Like, maybe even when they drive up, and you're still in the house. You can kind of get a feeling, oh, okay. Or, yeah, she's home, you know? And sometimes it's both at the same time. There is a spirit of you that's bigger than you. There is an of you that's not just limited to your physical body. There is an aura. There is a spirit. Don't get me new aging now, but there's true. There's an energy. There's a power. There's an authority beyond you. Am I right, Roshni? You feel it anywhere you go and everywhere you go. People are bigger than their bodies. Okay? That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the Father's spirit, the Father's aura, the Father's extension, is the radiation of himself into the atmosphere of the earth. That's the kingdom. As simply, and it's literally injected into the earth. Is actually, if you go look up the original language. So, we go into all the world because the system at work out there is not gentle, not humble of heart, is not a safe place. And so most people are walled up because it's not safe, because it's not gentle, because people are not humble of heart in the world system. They're walled up. And the kingdom comes to extend grace, to say, hey, if you come in here, you'll experience safety. You'll experience safe harbor. You'll be able to let down those walls and those protections that have protected you, actually not just from bad things, but from the Lord. So many people's walls and protections actually hide them from the power of God, from the grace of God. That's why these strongholds need to be destroyed because they protect people from the truth. So we go to expand the boundaries of the kingdom. And the kingdom is the context where Jesus is center and intentionally worshipped. That sounds like the church, right? The church is this place where Jesus is intentionally worshipped as center, as the place where creation draws life from. We leave here because people don't automatically come here. Amen? I remember. I can tell you stories about how I would, my mom would drag me to church as a kid and I did not want to go. But then I had an experience in the world that was so hard over time that I had to come to Safe Harbor. But it first came to me. So we go into all the world to expand the boundaries of the kingdom and to establish contexts outside of 1090 Wayne Avenue having the same come vision and mission. So let's think of it this way. How many people go to work tomorrow or some version of work? If you're teachers, you're going to go in a month or so. Sorry to remind you. I want, to, I want you to know something. Your job, for lack of a better term, is a cover. 
You do not exist to do your job. If you feel like you exist to do your job, I will tell you, you're still living according to a system of this world. If you exist to be light where you work, now think about this. If you exist to be light where you work, you will still do your job with excellence. In fact, you'll actually feel more compelled to be better, more equipped to do your job well because doing your job well is light. And light shines. And light draws. I'm going to tell you something, man. I love going into places of, of uh, like in the marketplace and try to find people that are really doing a good job, who really care about their work, who are into it and excited. And my attention is drawn. Anybody else? I love being in those environments. Now, if the son and daughter of God is excelling in the workplace, attention is drawn What's the goal? Is the goal that they would be what your job is? No, the goal would be that they would experience the one who compels you to be light. The point of being a nurse, a teacher, whatever it is that you are, is that people could experience this source, this where the light comes from. See, the ways of this world to try to take you off course and try to make it about the, the thing but the spirit of the thing is more important than the thing. Don't forget that. And so our goal, this is the beautiful part about going, is that our going is meant to create these kind of environments out there. That is the true extension of the kingdom. So in Chambersburg Hospital, in Greencastle, Chambersburg School Districts, name the place where you work. I have no idea, but it's everywhere. This place, this context... This, in Jesus, is center and intentionally worshipped. Now jumps into the middle of Chambersburg, Waynesboro, Shippensburg, Greencastle, and begins to extend and expand. That's why we're here. We're here to practice what we're going to do out there. We're going to be empowered and emboldened in here to do what we were created to do out there. Church isn't just about here, but it is about here. Because the coming empowers the going. If there's no coming, I can promise you the light is dim. The light doesn't attract. In fact, in many cases, it'll actually detract if there's not a, I have practiced intentionally worshiping Jesus. I've intentionally practiced what it's like to pattern my life after him and to walk with those who are also intentionally patterning their lives after him. And then I turn and go into the world and I'm skillful. Hello? Hello? There is a coming that must be obeyed and there's a going that must be obeyed. And in that, I believe, is the extension of God's heart in the earth. I am not going to continue on into the Ephesians, but I am, maybe another time I'll do that, talking about Ephesians 4, the fivefold ministry. Because I believe that's the, uh, the undergirding of how the church operates, but I can talk about that another time. Thank you, Lord. So let's pray together. And in case you're wondering, for me, prayer is just actually just turning my attention to this source of life, this Father who loves us. So God, you know, in these last couple of moments of being in this context of true flow with, I mean, right now, here we are in this beautiful, safe place where your heart is completely for us and the majority of this people, the majority of the people in this room are the same way. They're for me. They love me. And we're going to leave here, Lord, in a few moments and we're going to go into a system and into a flow that's not as harmonious. But there are, there are children out there. There's brothers and sisters and sons and daughters created by you, thoughtfully imagined by you. And they need to see light. 
And so I pray, Lord God, today that our coming will fuel our going. That we would truly be an empowered people who advance the Father's heart and culture wherever we go. I bless this family. I speak a blessing over each one of these folks that they would recognize how incredible they are. Humbly. You can, you can both recognize your value and be humble. I pray, Lord God, that there would be a recognition of their value so that the light can shine. And first, Lord, I just want to thank you for inviting us to come. What a privilege it is to be called yours. Thank you for taking these yokes and these burdens off of us that we were never meant to have. And thank you for putting on us the one you originally designed for us. And God, as we leave here and we go and be family to our personal families, as we go and do work and as we go and interact in the world, Father, I pray that who we really are calls to who others really are and it awakens them. I pray for awakening moments everywhere we go. And while we're together, can we just do this? Could you stretch out your hands over the roadways and uh, areas? I just really feel like I love to do this over our, every time I have a mic. Father, I speak life and protection over Route 81, over all the roadways in our area, Lord God, safety. Thank you. I, Father, I thank you for no accidents, no death in Jesus' name. I speak life. I speak abundance over our cities, our towns in this area. Lord God, may eyes of hearts open to experience you through us, even in dreams and visions. Give people dreams and visions of who you are, Lord. And may then they wake up and see us and say, I recognize that. May that be so, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all. Have a great week. Oh.